Hello from Storyhouse. This is Matthew Colton. You might have seen me in Peter Pan over Christmas. Today I'm going to read a little bit out of Peter Pan the book. This is for Alice, who turned 10 last Saturday and was also one of our very own pirates in the play at Christmas. Happy birthday, Alice. While they talked, they heard a distant sound. You or I, not being wild things of the woods, would have heard nothing. But they heard it. And it was the grim song. Yo ho, the pirate life, the flag, a skull and bones. A merry hour, a hempen rope, and hey for Davy Jones. Hey! At once the lost boys. But where were they? They are no longer here. Rabbits could not have disappeared more quickly. I will tell you where they are. With the exception of Nibs, who has darted away to reconnoitre, that is, look around, they are already in their home under the ground. A very delightful residence, of which we shall see a good deal presently. But how have they reached it? For there is no entrance to be seen. Not so much as a large stone which, if rolled away, would disclose the mouth of a cave. Look closely, however, and you may note that there are here seven large trees, each with a hole in its hollow trunk, as large as a boy. These are the seven entrances to the home under the ground, for which Hook has been searching in vain these many moons. Will he find it tonight? As the pirates advanced, the quick eye of Starkey sighted Nibs disappearing through the wood, and at once his pistol flashed out. But an iron claw gripped his shoulder. Captain! Let go! he cried, writhing. Now for the first time, we hear the voice of Hook. It was a black voice. Put back that pistol fast, it said, threateningly. It was one of those boys you hate. I could have shot him dead. Aye, and the sound would have brought Tiger Lily's redskins upon us. Do you want to lose your scalp? Shall I after him, Captain? Asked pathetic Smee. And tickle him with Johnny Corkscrew. Smee had pleasant names for everything, and his cutlass was Johnny Corkscrew because he wiggled it in the wound. One could mention many lovable traits about Smee. For instance, after killing, it was his spectacles he wiped instead of his weapons. Jolly is a silent fellow, he reminded Hook. Not now, Smee, Hook said darkly. He is only one, and I want to mischief all the seven. Scatter and look for them! The pirates disappeared among the trees, and in a moment... Their captain and Smee were alone. Hook heaved a heavy sigh, and I know not why it was, perhaps it was because of the soft beauty of the evening, but there came over him a desire to confide to his faithful bosun the story of his life. He spoke long and earnestly, but what it was all about Smee, who was rather stupid, did not know in the least. Anon, later, he caught the word Peter. Most of all, Hook was saying passionately, I want their captain, Peter Pan! T'was he cut off my arm. He brandished his hook threateningly. I've waited long to shake his hand with this. Oh, I'll tear him. And yet, said Smee, I have often heard you say that hook was worth a skewer of hands for combing the hair and other homely uses. Aye, the captain answered. If I was a mother, I would pray to have my children born with this instead of that. And he cast a look of pride upon his iron hand, and one of scorn upon the other. Then again he frowned. Peter flung my arm, he said, wincing, to a crocodile that happened to be passing by. I have often heard, said Smee, I noticed your strange dread of crocodiles. Not of crocodiles, Hook corrected him, but of that one crocodile.
crocodile. He lowered his voice. It liked my arm so much, Smee, that it has followed me ever since, from sea to sea and from land to land, licking its lips for the rest of me. In a way, said Smee, it's sort of a compliment. I want no such compliments, Hook barked petulantly. I want Peter Pan, who first gave the brute its taste for me. He sat down on a large mushroom, and now there was a quiver in his voice. Smee, he said huskily, that crocodile would have had me before this. But by a lucky chance it swallowed a clock which goes tick, tick inside it. And so before it can reach me, I hear the tick and bolt. He laughed, but in a hollow way. Some day, said Smee, the clock will run down, and then he'll get you. Hook wetted his dry lips. Aye, he said, that's the fear that haunts me. Since sitting down, he had felt curiously warm. Smee, he said, this seat is hot. He jumped up. Odds, bobs, hammer and tongs, I'm burning. They examined the mushroom, which was of a size and solidity unknown on the mainland. They tried to pull it up, and it came away at once in their hands, for it had no root. Stranger still, smoke began at once to ascend. The pirates looked at each other. A chimney! they both exclaimed. They had indeed discovered the chimney of the home under the ground. It was the custom of the boys to stop it with a mushroom when enemies were in the neighbourhood. Not only smoke came out of it, there came also children's voices. For so safe did the boys feel in their hiding place that they were gaily chattering. The pirates listened grimly and then placed the mushroom back on the hole. They looked around them and noted the holes in the seven trees. Did you hear them say Peter Pan's from home? Smee whispered, fidgeting with Johnny Corkscrew. Hook nodded. He stood for a long time lost in thought, and at last a curdling smile lit up his swarthy face. Smee had been waiting for it. Unrip your plan, Captain, he cried eagerly. To return to the ship, Hook replied slowly through his teeth, and cook a large, rich cake of a jolly thickness with green sugar on it. There can be but one room below, for there is but one chimney. The silly moles had not the sense to see they did not need a door apiece. <laughs> that shows they have no mother. We will leave the cake on the shore of the mermaid's lagoon. These boys are always swimming about there playing with the mermaids. They will find the cake and they will gobble it up because having no mother, they don't know how dangerous it is to eat rich, damp cake. <laughs> he burst into laughter. Not hollow laughter now, but honest laughter. <laughs> they will die. Smee had listened with growing admiration. It is the wickedest, prettiest policy ever I heard of, he cried. And in their exultation they danced and sang. A vast belay when I appear, I fear they're overtook. Not left upon your bones when you have shaken hands with Hook. <laughs> they began the verse, but they never finished it. For another sound broke in and stilled them. This was at first such a tiny sound that a leaf might have fallen on it and smothered it. But as it came nearer, it was more distinct. Tick, 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 tick. Hook stood shuddering, one foot in the air. The crocodile, he gasped and bounded away, followed by his bosun. It was indeed the crocodile. It had passed the Redskins, who were now on the trail of the other pirates. It oozed on after Hook. Once more the boys emerged into the open, but the dangers of the night were not yet over. For presently, Nibs rushed breathless into their midst, pursued by a pack of wolves. The tongues of the pursuers were hanging out, 
The baying of them was horrible. Save me! Save me! cried Nibs, falling on the ground. But what can we do? What can we do? It was a high compliment to Peter that at that dire moment their thoughts turned to him. What would Peter do? they cried simultaneously. Almost in the same breath they cried, Peter would look at them through his legs. And then, let us do what Peter would do. It is quite the most successful way of defying wolves. And as one, as one boy, they bent and looked through their legs. The next moment is the long one. But victory came quickly, for as the boys advanced upon them, in this terrible attitude, the wolves dropped their tails and fled. Now Nibs rose from the ground, and the others thought that his staring eyes still saw the wolves, but it was not the wolves he saw. I have seen a, a wonderfuller thing, he cried, as they gathered round him eagerly. A great white bird! It is flying this way! What kind of bird do you think? I don't know, Nibs said awestruck, but it looks so weary, and as it flies it moans, poor Wendy, poor Wendy. Poor Wendy? I remember, said Slightly, instantly, there are birds called Wendy's. See, it comes, said Curly, pointing to the Wendy in the heavens. Wendy was now almost overhead, and they could hear her plaintive cry, but more distinct came the shrill voice of Tinkerbell. The jealous fairy had now cast off all disguise of friendship and was darting at her victim from every direction, pinching savagely each time she touched. Hello, Tink, cried the wondrous boys. Tink's reply rang out. Peter wants you to shoot the Wendy. It was not in their nature to question when Peter ordered. Let us do what Peter wishes, cried the simple boys. Quick, bows and arrows. All but Tootles popped down their trees. He had a bow and arrow with him, and Tink noted it and rubbed her little hands. Quick, Tootles, quick, she screamed. Peter will be so pleased. Tootles excitedly fitted the arrow to his bow. Out of the way, Tink, he shouted, and then he fired. And Wendy fluttered to the ground with an arrow in her breast. Foolish Tootles was standing like a conqueror over Wendy's body, when the other boys sprang armed from their trees. You are too late, he cried proudly. I have shot the Wendy. Peter will be so pleased with me. Overhead, Tinkerbell shouted, Silly ass, and darted into hiding. The others did not hear her. They had crowded round Wendy, and as they looked, a terrible silence fell upon the wood. If Wendy's heart had been beating, they would all have heard it. Slightly was the first to speak. This is no bird, he said in a scared voice. I think this must be a lady. A lady, said Tootles, and fell a trembling. Oh, we have killed her, Nib said hoarsely. They all whipped off their caps. Now I see. Curly said. Peter was bringing her to us. He threw himself sorrowfully on the ground. A lady to take care of us at last, said one of the twins. And you have killed her. They were sorry for him, but sorrier for themselves. And when he took a step nearer them, they turned from him. Tootle's face was very white, but there was a dignity about him now that had never been there before. I did it, he said, reflecting. When ladies used to come to me in dreams, I said, Pretty mother, pretty mother. But when at last she really came, I shot her. He moved slowly away. Don't go, they called in pity. I must, he answered, shaking. I am so afraid of Peter. It was at this tragic moment they heard a sound which made their heart of every one of them rise to their mouths. They heard Peter crow, cock-a-doodle-doo! Peter, they cried, for it was always thus that he signalled his return. 
Hide her, they whispered, and gathered hastily around Wendy. But Tootles stood a lot aloof. Again came that ringing crow, and Peter dropped in front of them. Greetings, boys, he cried, and mechanically they saluted. And then again there was silence. He frowned. I am back, he said hotly. Why do you not cheer? They opened their mouths, but the cheers would not come. He overlooked it in his haste to tell the glorious tidings. Great news, boys, he cried. I have brought at last a mother for you all. Still no sound, except a little thud from Tootles as he dropped on his knees. Have you not seen her? asked Peter, becoming troubled. She flew this way. Ah, oh, me, one voice said, and another said, How mournful day! Tootles rose. Peter, he said quietly, I will show you to her. And when the others would still have hidden, he said, Back, twins, let Peter see. So they all stood back and let him see. And after he had looked for a little time, he did not know what to do next. She is dead, he said uncomfortably. Perhaps she is frightened at being dead. He thought of hopping off in a comic sort of way till he was out of sight of her, and then never going near the spot any more. They would all have been glad to follow if he had. But there was the arrow. He took it from her heart and faced his band. Whose arrow? he demanded sternly. Mine, Peter, said Tootle, still on his knees. Oh, dastard hand, Peter said, and he raised the arrow to use it as a dagger. Tootles did not flinch. He bared his breast. Strike, Peter, he said firmly. Strike true. Twice did Peter raise the arrow, and twice did his hand fall. I cannot strike, he said with awe. There is something stays my hand. All looked at him in wonder, save Nibs, who fortunately looked at Wendy. It is she, he cried. The Wendy lady, see her arm. Wonderful to relate, Wendy had raised her arm. Nibs bent over her and listened reverently. I think she said... Poor Tootles, he whispered. She lives, said Peter briefly. Slightly cried instantly, the Wendy lady lives. Then Peter knelt beside her and found his button. You remember, she had put it on a chain that she wore around her neck. See, Peter said, the arrow struck against this. It is the kiss I gave her. It has saved her life. I remember kisses, slightly interposed quickly. Now let me see it. Ah! Hey, that's a kiss. Peter did not hear him. He was begging Wendy to get better quickly so that he could show her the mermaids. Of course, she could not answer yet, being still a fright in a frightful faint. But from overhead came a wailing no note. Listen to Tink, said curtly. She is crying because the Wendy lives. Then they had to tell Peter of Tink's crime. And almost never had they seen him look so stern. Listen, Tinkerbell, he cried. I am your friend no more. Be gone from me forever. She flew onto his shoulder and pleaded, but he brushed her off. Not until Wendy again raised her arm did he relent sufficiently to say, Well, not forever, but for a whole week. Thank you for listening to this little extract from Peter Pan. I hope you've enjoyed it. Do keep in touch with us here at Story House. And remember, if you've got any requests for stories, just let us know in the comment box below. Stay safe and keep following us on social media. All the best and happy birthday, Alice.